Okay, uh, hi folks, can you hear me fine? All right. Um, so hi, I'm Yoss, and today I'm really excited to share with you serverless. So before we begin, how many of you prior to this have heard of serverless? A fair number of you. Uh, how many of you have production code in serverless? Oh, that's surprising. Okay, cool, cool. All right, so in this talk, uh, first we're going to look at what serverless is and why you might want to go serverless. We'll then look at functions as a service, which is a key component of serverless. Look at the process of designing serverless applications using uh, just single purpose functions. We'll then have a hands-on session where we look at building an actual serverless application, and that's it. So before we begin, um, when we say serverless, it doesn't actually mean that there are no servers, obviously. Um, it just means that we no longer have to think about them. So the way most web applications work is you have a user interacting through the browser, and the browser communicates with an application hosted on web servers. And these web servers are physical machines that needs to be provisioned, need to be maintained, needs to be upgraded, patched for security vulnerabilities, needs to be uh, load balanced, orchestrated to play well with each other. It's a lot of stuff to do. And you need dedicated personnel who has the technical know-how to do all these things properly. And sadly, however, how, no matter how good you become at DevOps, you will never be as good as Amazon, Google, Microsoft, and so on. That's the unfortunate truth. And even if you have the technical know-how, things can still go wrong. So that's why over the past few years, uh, improvements in the platform and networking layer have made provisioning servers and cloud computing in general more approachable. We no longer deploy our applications on like physical machines that might be in your living room or bedroom. And with the invention of the virtual, virtual machines, the hypervisor and containers, we now have more mature managed solutions in the form of platform as a service providers like Roku, DigitalOcean, and so on. And serverless is the next rung of this evolution upwards. So serverless is really about applying the single responsibility principle at the highest possible level. So for example, imagine a painter. You want to create a painting. And as a painter, you need all kinds of off-the-shelf tools like paint brushes, paint, and all kinds of tools so that you can go straight into painting, right? You don't want to, have to, you don't want, you don't want to worry about I need to make, first make a paintbrush, or I need to first make some dye to do the paint, and so on. You just want to get straight into painting. So as a software developer, we make use of a lot of services today. For example, backend services that take care of specific functionalities that are secondary but necessary, things like payments, uh, SMS, uh, transactional mail, things like, uh, uh, other things like file storage, also, more supporting services like PagerDuty for incident management, your CI CD system, of course, GitHub, and more office services like Dropbox and Trello and Slack, right? You already have a lot of off the shelf tools that help us do what the things that only we can do. So, the serverless philosophy is, aims to eliminate the need to manage infrastructure by using a managed compute service it's called Functions as a Service, which we will look at soon to execute your code, and leveraging, where possible, external services and APIs, such as Twilio, Stripe, SendGrid, and so on. So these are the two key philosophies, I think, of serverless. So next, let's look at uh, functions as a service, which is one of the key parts of serverless. So one of the biggest problems with traditional PaaS deployment or server deployments is provisioning. So provisioning is allocating capacity in order to handle your expected uh, traffic from your users. So in this diagram, you can see the uh, colored area, the dotted line, is the server capacity that you've allocated for your application. And the line that goes up and down is your actual traffic. So as you can see here, there's a wide gap between your actual allocated capacity and usage. So this means that you are basically over-provisioning. Uh, in other words, you're wasting money on uh, compute resources that doesn't do anything. It's idle time. You've, you're wasting money. So, 
And even if you've over-provisioned, in some cases, you can still find yourself under-provisioned. In cases of, for example, a really huge traffic, let's say your site gets picked up on Hacker News or a new site, suddenly you have a lot of traffic to your site and you still get, find yourself in a position where you can't serve all your users properly. So even with auto scaling groups, you will still, there will still be a gap between your allocated capacity and your actual usage. So this is a big problem, and this costs money um, if, you, if not done properly. So functions as a service is a managed compute service. Um, AWS Lambda is one example. And the way these platforms work is you upload your code to one of these platforms. You can then set up triggers for your function, for your, where uh, triggers where your code is executed, and then the fast platforms will only execute the code in response to these predefined triggers. And how do these platforms execute your code? So compared to traditional platforms as a service, in functions as a service, the uh, function processes are short-lived. Behind the scenes, uh, the a fast platform such as Lambda would have a fleet of containers. And when a Lambda function is invoked, meaning it's executed, the, Lambda, the, uh, AWS, uh, the fast platform will uh, spin up a container with an exec execution environment inside, load your code within the container, and execute. And at the end of the execution, the process will be terminated. So in other words, the servers only exist when you need it. So before we continue, let's just briefly look at three building blocks of functions as a service. So first we have events. Events triggers functions, and functions communicate with some resources. So let's start with functions. A function is a piece of code on the cloud. It has a single purpose. When you, try to, when you create a function, you should try to uh, use the uh, single responsive principle. So it does something granular, like creating a new blog post or sending a welcome email to a, a newly registered user, and so on. So this is an example of a Node.js function on AWS Lambda. So as you can see, it's a function called my function with a few inputs. So event, so in this case, the function takes in some uh, attributes from the event, the input event, adds them up, and returns the result in a callback function. So this is a very simple function. So events are things that can trigger functions. So this can be anything happening in your infrastructure. Uh, examples would be an HTTP request. Let's say uh, a user visits a particular route in your application, then that could invoke one function. So for example, let's say you have a RESTful, RESTful API, you have many routes, and each route could, go, could trigger a Lambda function that's just in charge of this, that particular functionality. And other events could be database events, scheduled events, and so on. So if you're using AWS and Lambda, these are the events that you can use to trigger the execution of your functions. For example, for most APIs, that would be HTTP using API Gateway. You have DynamoDB, which is a NoSQL database. For example, let's say if a new user, you want to send them an email when you have a new user, then you can configure your Lambda to be triggered whenever a new row is inserted to a DynamoDB table. And there are a couple of other services that Lambda can uh, connect to. <coughs> so finally, resources are supporting cloud services. So functions themselves, as we, as we see earlier, are stateless. Anything that happens within the function that you don't return at the end is lost, basically. So in order to persist state, within a function, you will need to communicate with other cloud services, like a DynamoDB table or a file storage service, in order to save user data, application data, and other kinds of state. So this can be NoSQL databases, REST APIs, and so on. So in summary, events triggers functions which communicate with resources. So what are the nice things about uh, building on top of functions as a service instead of like a traditional deployed application? Well, first you get scalability and high availability baked in. Uh, the fast platform will invoke as many functions as you need when you need it. So for example, if at a given period of time you have a thousand requests per second, then the fast platform will invoke that many function processes at that period of time. If in the next minute you only need five requests per second, 
then you only pay for that five requests. And there's no over-provisioning, over-allocation, there's no idle time. If you look, remember the, uh, the traffic graph? Your actual compute usage will actually match exactly the traffic that are incoming. So you don't need to capacity plan, you don't need to load balance, you don't need to provision servers, arcade capacity, none of this stuff. So this leads to less ops. Doesn't mean there are no ops, but there's less ops. You can focus more on other parts of your operations management. And it's low cost, because you only build by actual execution time, you're not paying for idle time. So here are some numbers. So for example, with Lambda, if you allocated 120 megabytes of memory to a function, executed it 30 million times a month, and it ran for 200 milliseconds each time, you pay less than $6 a month. And you also don't have to think about servers. So that's cool. What are not so nice things about function as a service? Well, the, the problem is you have distributed systems. For example, uh, debugging and monitoring is a bit harder. So for example, you can't SSH to an instance. So you need to have confidence in your monitoring. You have, need to have thorough logging and so on. Integration testing is also pretty hard. So for example, let's say you rely on Stripe for payments, for example. How do you test? You can't reproduce other external services locally in your machine. You either have to mock service calls locally, or you have to test with a staging or uh, staging environment. And you also have limited customization and control. With functions as a service, you don't have control over your execution environment. You can configure the memory uh, some, uh, to some degree, you have limited disk space, and you have limited uh, timeouts. So for example, so this is a list of things that uh, are limiting in AWS Lambda. Your functions can't execute for more than five minutes, for example. So it's not suitable for long-running tasks. Your functions only have 500 megabytes of scratch space. So you can't process huge video files in your functions, for example. Uh, yeah. So next, let's look at how we could design serverless applications uh, using this idea of functions, events, and resources. So we will build a, uh, okay, so not yet, sorry. So here's some of the things you can build with functions. It's surprisingly applicable to many use cases, things like uh, mobile uh, web APIs. So each uh, endpoint could be a function. You can also do things like asset processing, as we will see soon, web hooks, and so on. I think it is applicable to a large majority of use cases. So here's an example of a backend using Lambda functions. So you have an API gateway, which has many routes, and each route would go to a specific Lambda function. And behind the scenes, each Lambda function would communicate with different resources, either a file storage system, a NoSQL <coughs> database, and so on, or could be other Lambdas as well. Um, it's also, you can also use this for migrating legacy applications. So for example, you can imagine that our, we have a load balancer here that talks to our old legacy application. And for new endpoints, we would go to, uh, it would be implemented in, in Lambda functions. And gradually, we could migrate each endpoint of the old application to a serverless <laughs> approach. Uh, if you use GraphQL, you can also technically uh, run a, a GraphQL server as a function. Yep, something interesting. And so what we're gonna look at next is serverless asset processing in which we listen to many events within our system and we react to those events by performing arbitrary logic and do something. So let's look at the process of designing a non-trivial application, an image processing backend. Given an image on the left, we want to analyze this, uh, want to analyze this image for a face, if any, and crop the face. So normally in a traditional application, if you expect if your load is expected to be high, then normally you alloc you um, provision like a huge instance, each huge EC2 instance or something, and most of the time it'll just be sitting idle and only during peak hours is it fully utilized. So what we're gonna build this image pipeline with is a set of AWS services. Again, the philosophy of serverless is to uh, leverage on external services as, as much as possible and put your custom code within a managed compute service with Lambda. So we use Lambda, S3, which is a fast storage service, if DynamoDB and IDWS recognition is an image recognition API. So, so how do we do this? We only have functions, really single purpose functions. How do we make something really complex such as an image processing pipeline? 
So in computer science, we have something called divide and conquer. Where we have a big problem, and given a big problem, we split it to smaller sub-problems. Then we solve the smaller sub-problems, combine all the solutions, and basically we solve the biggest problem. Right? Likewise, we can take this approach when we're designing serverless applications. So, so it's kind of similar to the Unix philosophy, where we write small self-contained programs that work well together. So we can decompose our image processing pipeline into a series of steps, and each step could be handled by a function that themselves auto-scale and don't need uh, provisioning. So this is what we are going to build, basically. So, um, so you remember the event triggers functions which can be re with resources. The way our image pipeline will work is given an event, it will trigger a function. The function uh, performs some state, uh, stateful operation within our infrastructure, which results in an event that triggers the next function in our pipeline. So the first function is downloading the image. So the user provides an image to our backend through HTTP. And that HTTP event triggers a function called download image, which uploads the image to Amazon S3. And once this process is completed, S3 emits an event, which triggers the next function in our pipeline. In this case, the analyze image function. So the analyze image function uses AWS recognition to identify faces in the newly uploaded image in S3. And it then writes the results to DynamoDB, which then emits another event that triggers the next function in our pipeline. So the process image is the one that actually crops the image and it uploads to S3. And it emits an event, but in this case, we're not using it to trigger anything. And to the view, the view the images through an HTTP API, it's as simple as specifying a view image function that is triggered by an HTTP event that pulls the results from our DynamoDB table and S3 so that users can view the images. So as a result, we can what we get is an event-driven pipeline that has less ops, is scalable, so each function is automatically scaled and provisioned. This to faster development, you don't have to think about servers. It's horizontally scalable because, again, you don't have to worry about capacity or allocating provisioning, and it's cheap because you only pay for actual usage, not idle time. All right, so finally, we're going to look at uh, some hands-on on how you can go about building service applications. So what I rec recommend you to do is, if you want to build a service application, is to use a framework. So one such framework is called the service framework. So this is a CLI that helps you develop, deploy your Lambda functions. It gives you a lot of things out of the box, things like different environments, uh, staging, uh, uh, yeah, di different environments, automation, a lot of things, basically. And it has a very active open source community. You have a lot of plugins for new functionalities, and makes things incredibly easy. And importantly, it's provide a platform agnostic, so you can use this for AWS, GCP, IBM OpenWhisk, Azure, and so on. And you only have to learn it once, basically. So let's, let me just go straight to the hands-on. So, uh, what, what, so the key part of this framework is that we have a YAML file. Basically, this is DSL that describes your service. And it describes things like, for example, which platform you're using, which runtime, um, and the uh, different functions that you have. For example, if a download image function for image pipeline, it specifies where it lives. For example, so it lives in the folder functions, download image, and you can specify the events that trigger this function. So HTTP is one of the uh, possible triggers, but as you can see, other functions are triggered by different events, in this case, S3. So in this case, in this analyze image function, we can see that this function is triggered by a new S3 event for a specific bucket, and only if it's a newly uploaded file. And you can also have other rules, like if it's uploaded to a particular folder, and so on. You can have other events, like uh, DynamoDB, uh, HTTP, and so on. And so this framework is also where you define your spotting resources. As I mentioned, things like a NoSQL database or a file storage service, you can define them in this uh, file, and then you can simply run serverless deploy, 
and the framework will just deploy, essentially behind the scenes, this would translate to the uh, things like cloud formation, depending on the platform that you're using, and then deploys all the infrastructure that is needed to support that application. And at the end, if you have, uh, if your function is an HTTP endpoint, you can get a URL that uh, you can use to trigger the function, basically. So for example, in this case, you have fewer URLs for our image pipeline. And you can trigger it. Yeah. So in terms of the, so the functions themselves are fairly straightforward. So in this, for example, this is the view image function. Um, first, you have uh, an event, which is the input. And in this case, we're calling DynamoDB get uh, API to pull the item from uh, our table. And then we return the response back to the client. So that's pretty much it. So in summary, we learned about how serverless came to be, why you might want to go serverless and what it is. Uh, we learned about some fast concepts, functions, events, resources, benefits, execution model, and cost. We learned about the process of designing a serverless application using just that function abstraction. And we learned about building, how you can go about building serverless applications using the serverless framework, very briefly. Uh, yep, yeah, that's it, thank you. Uh, sorry, uh, I forgot. Um, so if you're interested to learn more about uh, serverless, uh, you can get this book at 25% off today. You can just go to the website. There. Yep. Thank you, Ross. Okay, uh, before we go online, I have a quick announcement.